Welcome back. A vicious civil war in Colombia over the last 50 years has left an estimated 600,000 dead, many more wounded, and millions displaced. To make matters worse, both the leftist guerrillas who declared war on the state and right-wing paramilitaries fighting them have fueled their battles with cocaine sales and kidnapping. While the guerrillas appeared to be basically a peasant uprising at their core, and at least in the beginning, they were influenced, supported, and supplied some by communists. The paramilitaries were financed by big landowners. The government's military was the other factor in this three-way civil war. Some in the military condoned, even helped, the paramilitaries. Parts of all three, in varying degrees, did increasing business with drug cartels. The United States has invested billions of dollars in trying to end the war and combat the drug trade. For years, all seemed hopeless. But Colombia now has a different approach to ending the conflict, one that relies as much on open arms as heavy arms. And it just might be a model for other countries mired in civil wars. Colombia's capital, Bogota, a city that seems to never stop sprawling outward and upward as its growth is fueled by millions fleeing violence in other parts of the country. But even here, there's been no escaping the bloodshed of Colombia's complicated civil war. Kidnappings, car bombs, killings, deadly leftists, many say communist guerrilla groups aiming to overthrow Colombia's government brought their fight literally into the capital. For years, attacks were frequent, deadly, brazen. No one was safe. Not even in the heavily guarded presidential palace. Example, it's 2002, just minutes before a new president is sworn in. Suddenly, mortar shells rain on the city's main plaza and the presidential palace. Fourteen are killed, and the country's prospects for peace seemingly drenched in blood. But now, ten years later, I can see hope alive again. Here, in the same plaza where mortars fell, a salsa festival. Thousands shake their hips without fear, the recent culmination of years of relative calm in the capital. A few years back, I would never have thought it possible, but today, Bogota is one of South America's economic, cultural, and creative centers. A boom town without the booms. The progress that we have made, I think is, uh, and modesty apart, remarkable. Juan Manuel Santos is the latest of 12 Colombian presidents to try to find an end to the country's civil war, and many say he has the best chance. Let's talk about Colombia today. I'm interested in having you say what you see is the difference between the perception of Colombia and the change that the new reality has brought. Because I think in some people's mind, it's a revolutionary, torn apart country with drug cartels, mafia, agrarian revolutionaries, uh, right-wing hit squads. It's a murderous, chaotic place. You're completely right. There's many people still have that uh, vision that we are, what you just described, because we were. We were a country where uh, we had the highest kidnapping rate, highest murder rate, violations of all kinds of human rights. I mean, that was a reality. Not anymore. In the jungles of Colombia, bullets are still flying. <laughs> but Colombia's government says the ranks of leftist rebels known as FARC now number fewer than 8,000, <laughs> down from a peak of 18,000 fighters just a decade ago. And as for the rival right-wing militias, they have been mostly disbanded, and it's been years since they roamed the countryside terrorizing civilians. 
The roots of this turnaround trace back a decade ago, when then-Colombian President Alvaro Uribe tried a radical new approach to peace, a mixture of carrot and stick. On one hand, he deployed Colombia's military in a massive U.S.-backed offensive against FARC, seizing wide swaths of rebel-held territory and taking out top leaders. But it was the other half of the equation that was truly radical, and until then, unthinkable. Uribe decided to offer fighters from both sides a chance to simply opt out of the war, to lay down their arms without consequence. And now, many men and women who spent decades hiding and fighting in the jungle are now among the crowds going about their daily lives, trying to re-enter society as civilians. No, pues, los actos que más me arrepiento es cuando tocaba quemar, quemar las viviendas de personas, de personas campesinas, hacerlas venir del, de su entorno, nada más porque los comandantes daban la orden. Entonces, eso para mí era muy doloroso, sabiendo que la vivienda es una cosa muy sagrada. We came to this Bogota neighborhood to hear the story of one of these ex-fighters. His name is Edwin Munera, and he spent years prowling the jungle as a diehard member of a merciless right-wing killing squad. Entonces, al ver uno que tenía, peleaba uno con la con la guerrilla, peleaba, tenía que correrle uno a la, al ejército y matándonos entre nosotros mismos, entonces eso ya es, pues la guerra es de locos, pero entonces ahí ya era más locura todavía. In 2004, Manera and two comrades made the daring decision to desert their troop. Entonces le tocaba a uno caminar en la noche y dormir en el día o descansar, no dormir sino descansar, porque de todas maneras éramos tres y entre los tres hacíamos guardia para que no nos fueran a alcanzar, porque ellos, ellos nos siguieron hasta cierta parte para ver si nos podían capturar para así darnos de baja para mostrarles escarmiento a los demás que, que no se podían desertar. Munera finally reached an army outpost, laid down his rifle and began a six-year process that would eventually lead to a completely new life. Today, he works as a foreman for a construction crew. Few around him know about his violent past. What was the hardest part of starting a new life? La parte más difícil, eh, encontrarse con la familia. Con la family, bastante, porque pues uno viene a estar acostumbrado de, de ya que nadie le diga nada, de evadir responsabilidades, de ser un patán, porque de todas maneras uno, al ser uno una persona que no, que no tiene sino orden, hijo, porque tiene que ver con un arma encima, entonces no hace uno caso. Los derechos de las demás personas, los derechos de uno. Entonces llega uno como un animalito otra vez a la, a la ciudad. Listo, no hay ningún problema. We have more than 50,000 people who have demobilized. Many of them only knew how to kill, only knew how to extort or kidnap. And uh, many of them were recruited when they were kids, uh, children. So these type of people, you have to put them through a process of uh, becoming a normal citizen and uh, a productive citizen. And a society that does not understand that you have to do this will be condemned to live in violence forever. Because if you President Santos knew this was no easy task. So he tapped this former Wall Street banker to the cabinet level position of reintegration minister. His name is Alejandro Eder, and his job is to prepare ex-fighters for life after war. Let me, as remote as it must seem, play the role now of a hardworking average Colombian who's saying to himself, why should I give somebody who was part of waging war in my country, on my country for 50 years. Why should I give him any break at all? In Colombia, pretty much every Colombian has been touched by violence. I've been touched by violence. I've had family members killed and I've had family members kidnapped, not to mention friends and, and, and family of friends. So Colombians have to realize, and slowly we are, that if we want there to be peace in Colombia, we actually have to make peace 
with those who have hurt us so much. There's still a lot of Colombians that ask me, why is the government investing so much money in the demobilized? And to give you an idea, good question. We, we invest about $2,000 per demobilized person per year. That's how much we invest in re-educating them, giving them psychological attention, and giving them a monthly stipend as long as they comply with everything. There's two ways to end the violence. We can do this, which has a cost of about $2,000 per person per year, or we can go for the outright military solution, fight them all until the last man is down or in jail. That is a significantly more expensive way of doing it. It has more direct costs, more indirect costs. So in essence, the reintegration program can't be seen as a cost. The reintegration program is an investment in Colombia's future. These men and women are all recent guerrilla defectors. Just a few weeks ago, they were sworn enemies of the state. But today, they are starting the journey into a new life. This is the beginning of the reintegration process. A lecture on human rights in the city's main public library. Por eso que se dice que hasta la guerra tiene límites. Cuando se utilizan niños, se están rompiendo esos límites. If there was any question about how bloody this civil war is, you only need to listen to this discussion. Cuando se toman prisioneras de guerra y se abusa sexualmente, cuando hay, digamos, reclutamiento de niños. These are men and women who not only saw, but in some cases, participated in unimaginable brutality and starting at a very young age. Now, they need to find a way to move on. I think there's a lot of rhetoric. The Colombian government is very good at selling itself. Michael Reed Hurtado is a Bogota-based human rights lawyer, a well-known columnist, and one of the most outspoken skeptics of the Colombian government's reintegration program. It has sold a lot of lies, and unfortunately, there hasn't been sufficient um, in-depth investigation into what happened. He says the government is exaggerating the success of the program, starting with inflating the number of defected fighters. It's like guerrillas are coming from nowhere and demobilizing and demobilizing and demobilizing and demobilizing. This should at least send alerts out uh, to say, we're probably getting a lot of false positives in the demobilizations. We're probably having a lot of people that are not really combatants demobilized. Reed says the government also failed in the early years to ensure thousands of ex-combatants didn't fall back into violence. He says many fighters simply disappeared from the program and joined deadly drug gangs. And then there's the question of whether the Colombian government is simply overstating the success of its reintegration program for political reasons. The Colombian military was eager for news crews to film the defection of this large group of guerrillas, one by one, laying down their arms and turning themselves in. But it was soon revealed that many of these people had never actually been real rebel fighters. We were talking about how the program had developed from its beginning. Any mistakes? Plenty of mistakes. And, I, and I'd say we're still making a lot of mistakes today. But I think that if you look at the sum of the program, if you look at the challenge that we're facing and the way that we're carrying it forward, I'd say that the program is, is doing quite well. And it turns out that's well enough for the United States, Colombia's most important ally. Traditionally, aid from Washington has gone to Colombia's military. But since 2006, the United States has also pumped 124 million to support Colombia's reintegration program. When we return, what is life like for former Civil War fighters returning to society? That's coming up next. Over our time in Colombia, we heard a lot about how former fighters on both sides of an unimaginably bloody and brutal civil war were being welcomed back into society. Their paths wiped clean by a Colombian government determined to end the conflict. 
Understand, the people you're about to meet were seasoned fighters who now must prove they can live peacefully as civilians. We met former Marxist guerrilla Aramiro Estupinan Batista in a slum building in one of Bogota's most violent neighborhoods with his family and several other defected fighters. He says he's happy, but living on the margins. Sí, aquí hay muchas familias, pues. hay inquilinos eh, y familias, tres familias, por ejemplo, la de cuñado mío que vive arriba con los cuatro hijos y la mujer, eh, la otra cuñada aquí con el cuñado eh, y el niño y nosotros allá en las dos piecitas de aquel lado, en una donde duermen los niños y, y la otra donde dormimos nosotros. Este es el, el aviso de, de, de cada familia al aseo, donde cada uno le toca un día diferente. It can take almost two hours for Estupinan to get to work. He sells mobile phone and data plans to passers-by on the street in this busy downtown plaza. Muy buenos días, servicio de Claro, Internet, Telefonía, Televisión. Servicio de Claro, Internet, Telefonía, Televisión. It's a tough way to make a living. Even the longest days sometimes bring him less than five dollars. Buenos días, servicio de Claro, Internet, Telefonía, Televisión. Still, as Tupinan says, he would rather struggle as a civilian than return to a life of war. <laughs> and he says he's very grateful Colombia's government has given him a second chance. Entonces, es como el como la liberación que uno tiene más estando allá que estando ahorita en la vida civil, porque ya uno se se rige a uno mismo, ya no tiene que regirse por otro, o no tiene que ser mandado por otro. Sino que ya uno se manda eh, uno mismo, uno mismo se, se da la, la estima, todo se, se lo pone uno mismo en voluntad de uno y no, es, no esperar que otro se lo dé al gusto de él. A Stupinan says his greatest worry was being feared and rejected by ordinary Colombians. The bloodshed is still so fresh, the war so raw. But he found a home in a most unlikely setting, a place where trust is paramount. This former guerrilla fighter now volunteers with children and adults with special needs. Every week, Estupinan teaches bicycle racing and finds acceptance. Los papás de los niños confían en uno porque, hombre, ellos le miran la capacidad a uno, porque ellos saben que uno uno fue de de organizaciones. No, usted fue una organización, pero como usted es ahorita, a como usted era ya, es ahorita acá, si le preguntan a uno. Entonces uno le dice, no, ya uno es muy diferente. Vamos con todas, levantando puertas, Jonathan, vamos con todas. This particular program is called FIDES, and for 25 years, its mission has been to provide an outlet for a special needs community that was long ignored in Colombia. Votamos, por favor. I came for softball practice in a Bogota park one afternoon, and it was there that I met up with Edwin Manera, whom we introduced you to earlier. The ex-paramilitary fighter also volunteers in the program. You have a nice glove, huh? Le presento a Iván. Mucho gusto. Mucho gusto. Vamos! So let's see your red glove, huh? May I? Huh? Okay. Muy bien, joyita. Muy bien, joyita. Si ve que ellos también se agachan. Ellos también se agachan. Ellos también se agachan. Ok, good. Muy bien. Yay. Bravo. Well, you told us earlier, you described the kids you work with here as angels, and you said they helped you to get rid of your fears. What were your fears? uno le, le, le ayuda a ellos, pero ellos le ayudan a uno más en el, en, en, en el, en el sentido de que uno viene con, con muchas debilidades, con muchos temores, digamos, a enfrentar una sociedad, a, a hablar uno con, con otra persona, a poderle tocar el hombro, eh, a poder abrazarlo. Entonces, esos temores ellos le ayudan a uno bastante, ellos le quitan a, bastante esos temores a uno, le dan a uno confianza para uno enfrentar la sociedad. Alejandro Escallón founded this program, and he says the former fighters and the people with special needs 
actually have something important in common. They have both faced rejection. And now, he says, Monera and the others are among his best volunteers. They are more eager than the regular volunteers. So we are very happy with them. Well, what made you decide to try as an experiment? It was at first an experiment. What made you decide to try to get the people who are being rehabilitated from the wars to work with these children? First, when we began doing this program with the volunteers, we saw that they changed. They grew up better. Why not give the same experience to people that need love, that need to be hugged, that need to, be, that need to see life in a different way? So we said this is an experiment, and the experiment worked out. Well, in the beginning, did you have concerns among the caregivers and parents saying, wait a minute, you're bringing in these people who are killers and they've been at war, there must have been some concern. At the beginning we were concerned, after we met them, we were not concerned. They have met all our families, we are friends of them. They, are, they belong to Fides, they talk about us as Fides and they say this is my best family. So I think Fides has done a great uh, change in their lives and I think and I'm sure they have done a great change in our lives too. Muy bien. Monera hasn't missed a Saturday morning since he started volunteering seven years ago. He says children, particularly these children, are not judgmental. And that, more than anything else, has eased his transition into society. It may be a difficult question, but why do you and others who are fighting so long and bringing so much violence to the country, why do you deserve a second chance? No, no la merecemos por lo que somos personas y como personas fallamos, pero también nos podemos reivindicar. Y, y yo creo que caerse para levantarse no es caerse. Y si se para usted, se para con más fuerza y con más firmeza de no volver a repetir los errores que cometió en el pasado. There are fresh signs of hope that Colombia's own civil war might be coming to an end. FARC's once intractable leaders are in the midst of talks with Colombia's government, the closest the two sides have been to reaching peace in decades. And other countries are taking notice. The Philippines, Sri Lanka, and Congo are all using Colombia's reintegration program as a kind of model as they try to find an end to their own internal conflicts. If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at axis.tv.